First and foremost, I wanted to say what an incredible, um, incredible spectacular group of people I've seen over the last couple of hours. And um, it's not every day. We, in New York, we happen, you know, we have a, a very, uh, how should I put it, skeptical audience usually. Um, so I just want to say it's been a real um, just beacon of hope here. Let's call it a conspiracy of progress uh, that we've been seeing today. And I say that in all due respect to the helm of, of uh, Rick Perry. So um, one of the things I want to talk to you guys about today is this notion that how do we think about sound in the 21st century as a kind of ambiguous space where we can think of some of the issues that in the 20th century have migrated to various parts of culture and the arts in the 21st century. So what I'm going to do today is walk you guys through some of the material that I've been working on in my last two or three books and then kind of pull that into a live experience with a um, wonderful string ensemble from Austin uh, that you'll see as an example. So if I can see the uh, iPad, there we go. And what I want to do is kind of quickly walk you guys through uh, some of the material that I think will be helpful to get you into this notion that, for me, music isn't music, it's information. And as we've been seeing in the 21st century with the rise of social networks and with the rise of the sort of density of information that we all call home in the information economy, um, most of the issues that we now think of as almost obvious, um, even a century ago, would have been at the edge of what was possible. So I want to begin this discussion with a quick question. How many of you all have smartphones? Probably, OK. That's probably the only 100% question of the day, <laughs> right? So one of the things I always think about as an artist is, OK, we always tend to use the tools of the past to describe the present and somehow condition and contextualize the near future. So it's like describing a Prius car with saying, oh, it has 400 horsepower. You know, it doesn't work. So when we think of these metaphors and we think of these ways of describing the, the creative practice, we always use these kinds of metaphors that just don't apply anymore. So let me show you a fun example, because I always think it's better to do a visual kind of pun here. So one of my, considering we're talking about the idea of beyond measure, one of my favorite theoreticians of the idea of value is a gentleman by the name of Adam Smith. Now, in the 18th century, Adam Smith uh, wrote a very famous book called The Wealth of Nations, or Inquiry into the Causes of Wealth of Nations. Um, he was trying to figure out this idea of value. Now, we're talking about measurement, we're talking about value, so they're, they're two kind of reflexive axioms. And he came up with a paradox of value. And it's, it's now become a very famous mathematical uh, paradox, which is literally called paradox of water and diamonds. Now, um, back in the day, and I do say way back, because we're talking a couple centuries ago, um, diamonds were very highly valued. They were rare. They were incredible emblems of wealth and power and prestige. And meanwhile, something that was essential to life, like water, um, essentially was taken for granted. So, he tried to figure out what would make people go to war, uh, destroy, occupy, take over all sorts of other kingdoms, and at the same time uh, come up with whole different ways of uh, creating an economy of scarcity. So at the end of the day, I use this idea of Adam Smith's idea of water versus diamonds to start thinking about free culture, free art, and above all, free creativity. So in the 21st century, the idea here is that we're looking at more and more of the notion of digital literacy. And what I've been trying to figure out as an artist is how do we get people to reframe some of the issues of the present day? And I like this pun here of the idea of jump, by the way. I'm, you're going to note I'm going to pull up bits and pieces during the discussion because I have a kind of nonlinear way of thinking here. Um, let's go into the idea of some uh, local folk so you guys can kind of call home here. This is a remix. Um, so we take the face of one person and mix and match and remix. And you get that, right? We got a sense of visual pun, what Marshall McLuhan would call a visual pun. Now, in the realm of sound, the same kind of situation happens when you edit and transform a sample. So what I want to do today is pull you guys into the realm of DJing, not as an artist or musician, but more as a theoretician. And again, I'm going back to the root word of phonograph, which Thomas Edison liked to think of as recording these um, unhidden moments. I'm kind of use that phrase, unhidden, like the idea of the everyday but at the same time, something that's at the edge of the possible. Um, so Sigmund Freud liked to call this the uncanny. And so if you go to the German term unheimlich, it simply means the unhomely. So the idea of a sample plays a very strange sort of paradox with the idea of context versus content. You take something that everybody kind of knows, you flip it, you edit it, you transform it, and it becomes something new that still has a trace of that memory. So we've now seen a generation of kids growing up with hip-hop, techno, dubstep, drum and bass, 
all of these different styles of music that are part of the everyday fabric of the urban landscape. So in the last several years, I've been doing a series of projects about sound and art. And I've been doing museum shows from the Guggenheim to the Tate Modern. And this year, I'm going to be the first artist in residence at the Met Museum in New York. Um, and the idea is, how do we figure out 21st century roles of art? If you go to a wealthy person's house, for example, the idea of scarcity is very obvious. There's 12 Picassos in a certain style, so the person buys a painting that's $2 million to $5 million, because guess what? There's only a couple of them. But with digital media, the idea of the copy is now what we call home. So that again goes back to that Adam Smith idea of scarcity versus ubiquity. So if we think of water and then think of information, right? these are the environments that we inhabit, free culture. So the pun here, as we move further and further into the 21st century, is the landscape itself is a kind of an information aesthetic topology, a landscape made of the codes of culture. So, in my most recent book, uh, called The Book of Ice, I took a studio to Antarctica and went to all the main ice fields and was trying to figure out some ways as an artist and as a composer uh, to hit the reset button on the idea of how a composer would engage landscape. Um, now, if you go back to, the, again, the ancient 20th century, um, what's going further and further in the rearview mirror is this idea of the culture of what we call mass production. Uh, the 20th century, the factory model, Andy Warhol, Jeff Koons, you name it. As we move further into the 21st century, we're moving into the era of mass customization. The idea of being able to pull bits and pieces of material and forge new culture from old. So what I wanted to do with the Antarctica project was to start thinking about ice, not as a physical medium, but as a cultural reference point. And kind of, uh, it's a long story, but considering we're here in Texas, I'm sure we can go down with a sense of humor here. Uh, black people love ice. You know, we got ice cube, iced tea, right? Um, you got the white guy, you got vanilla ice, you know? So uh, the pun here is how do we move from a metaphor into a physical realm? And that's something that I'm going to be finding more and more as we move further into the 21st century about this idea of pattern recognition. So the environment is always made of overlapping patterns. And this is something that Nancy's been talking about as she's been introducing many of the artists here today, is we're looking at this idea of beyond measure, but still using some of the older tools and ways and metaphors of describing things. Uh, one of my favorite poets and philosophers, Walt Whitman, had a very great phrase that I think responds to Nancy's topic of, or theme, which is simply uh, from Leaves of Grass, where he says one beautiful, elegant phrase that it's a great soundbite. Um, he says, so what if I contradict myself? I am large, I contain multitudes. So if you start thinking about sampling the environment, one of the things that really kind of has to come home to roost is that you have to dig into this as, it's a, as if it's an archive. And I started to, trying to think about the idea of landscape and sound and this idea of acoustic topologies and started thinking about how would I transform that sound into how a composer would make a string quartet or a symphony or for that matter a painter would take the palette and create a painting or a sculpture would take a material and shape and mold it. So the archive for me is one of the ways that I measure my environment. And if you think about hip hop, techno, dubstep, drum and bass, all of these styles, the idea is that you have to go into the roots of the archive and they, that's where the new material comes from. So with ice, you're seeing a subatomic molecular structure of ice, which is based on hexagonal form. There's always a six-sided hexagon, but the beautiful part of this is there's an elegant mathematics at the core of nature. Uh, what uh, theoreticians like, you know, God, there's so many, where would I start? Uh, James Gleick, for example, this idea of emergent complexity in nature. Um, but one of my favorite theoreticians of this is Douglas Hofstadter. He has a great book called Godel Escher Bach where he's trying to figure out these beautiful recursive loops that make up the fabric of reality. So in my most recent book, The Book of Ice, um, I worked with a quantum physicist by the name of Brian Greene, and he has a very renowned book called The Elegant Universe. And I wanted to figure out a way to transform some of these ideas of ice into a music composition. So what we're going to hear today is a kind of um, a rendition of a graphic design project that's been turned into a string ensemble looking at the environment and the idea of pattern recognition. And it's loosely referencing one of my favorite composers, John Cage. Um, in 1948, uh, he had a, or 1939, he had a piece called Imaginary Landscape, and it's considered to be the first composition for turntables. So what I did in the last uh, year or so was come up with an iPad app, and I've been working uh, with MusicSoft Arts and uh, Apple, and we've been coming up with fun ways of thinking about tools that allow you to transform some of these 20th versus 21st century aesthetic models. Now, the turntable is a very 19th and early 20th century platform. But what I want to do today is I invite the two musicians up. And they're from Austin, so please give them a shout. This is Tani and Alexis. 
And um, we're going to just kind of pull you guys into the realm of contemporary composition. Now, with my iPad app, one of the fun parts about this is that um, I never expected it to be a popular app. It was just kind of a series of conversations with a couple of executives about software development. And um, what we wanted to figure out was ways to migrate the turntable into a 21st century platform and keep it free. So it's free on the iTunes App Store, and it also allows you to mix music videos if you happen to be into that. And you can pull that straight into there, pull it into the DJ mixer, assign it to record cover sleeves, make your own playlist, and bam, you get very much into the 21st century idea of mass customization. So what we're going to do here today is I'm going to sample loop and layer. And the reason I'm calling this a string quartet um, is there's two turntables and two players, and I'm going to be remixing them all. So the pun here is how do we think about sound and sampling? Um, it's a memory game, and that's what I want to play with you guys today. You're going to hear quotations of everything from Stravinsky to Vivaldi, uh, WC and Mozart and so on, but in a live real-time context. And above all, um, I just want to say thank you so much to the musicians for being flexible. It's not every day you get to say, hey, can I sample you live, right? You know? <laughs> so uh, you guys ready? All right, here we go. Um, and you're going to be seeing two turntables. I'm going to be sort of looping and layering, so just bear with if there's any, if there's any mistakes, you can you know, hang the DJ, as the Smiths used to say, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. Ready?
So um, one of the things I just want to end on a, on a beautiful, hopefully um, uplifting note is that the arts have always had an important role in determining how I think people frame the idea of the present and the near future. So I just want to kind of leave with the one like hopeful note just to say, um, for me, the imagination is the ultimate renewable resource. So thank you very much, and um, it's been a real pleasure.